Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome to South Hybrid uh, Q and A forum. Um, we're going to go through uh, some quick introductions. Our goal today is uh, to answer as many questions as we can for you uh, within this 45 minute period of time about our hybrid uh, procedures. Um, we will have a, a moderator, uh, Ms. Delaney, who's going to be uh, asking questions that you have. Um, if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a toolbar and there'll be a, a icon that says chat. If you click on that, that will allow you to type into our panelists any questions that you would like to ask. Please make sure that these, these questions are general. If there's a, a question specifically for your child, please e email me that directly and we can have a conversation. This is a question and answer for the, the whole. The only people who will be seeing your question will be our panelists here. So uh, to start off, I am Dr. Jim Morrison, principal here at South Middle School. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Sherry Rosen, one of the associate principals here at South. Hi, everyone. Steve Perkins, the other associate principal here at South. And I'm Carol Meyer. I'm one of the district certified school nurses. Um, I'm sitting in for Mrs. Joyce this evening as she was unavailable. And I'm Mary Beth Delaney. I'm a teacher here at South Middle School, and I'll be um, reading the questions that you come up with and looking for themes and sharing those with the panelists as the night goes on. All right. And so looking at our topics, these general topics that you see here, we're going to do a very quick presentation of these topics. You've already seen uh, these through our uh, hybrid procedures document that I shared out with you through the Cardinal Corner as well as through emails. Um, we're just going to briefly touch base on it. Hopefully that'll help you um, navigate some of your questions or answer some of your questions before uh, we get uh, going. So, um, so let's start off at the beginning. Uh, as you know, uh, we begin our hybrid schedule starting next Tuesday with our sixth grade joining us. Uh, uh, the following week would be our seventh and eighth grade. This Monday coming up, um, I emailed you today, we are going to be running our uh, remote Monday schedules, uh, which is a little different than most uh, of our days. Uh, this will allow us to help plan for the both the hybrid and the remote learners throughout the week. Uh, students coming in Tuesday, Thursday, will have the last names A through K and Wednesday through Friday, L through Z. Now real briefly about moving in and out of school, coming, coming to school. So arriving uh, at school, whether you're coming, you know, your child's coming off the bus or out of your car or walking to school, as soon as they reach uh, school grounds or they're stepping onto the bus, please make sure your child has their mask on. There's no ands, ifs, or buts about wearing a mask. I will say of all things, we will not be lenient on wearing masks your child be directed and asked once to put the mask on. If it continues throughout the day that your child refuses or does not put the mask on, we will ask you to come get them. It, there's no ands, ifs, or buts. Um, as they arrive, uh, students will need to keep their social distance six feet apart. We'll do the best we can to remind your child of that. Uh, seventh grade, you, the children will be lining up at the north side of the building. We will be directing them that in that area. Eighth grade would be in the, the center of the school on the east side. And the sixth grade will be at the south end of the, the building. Uh, there will be dots on the ground to keep our distance. We'll be asking kids to stand on the dots until they're, they're let in. Um, if you're uh, dropping your child off via vehicle, please make sure you pull in through our center driveway and move up as far as you can before you stop and let your child out. Um, because we'll have multiple cars pulling in and out uh, throughout the morning. 
If you decide and you come in to wait, pick up your child and you come out of the car, we ask you to wear masks as well. Anytime you're on school property, please make sure you are wearing masks and keeping your social distances. All right, I'm gonna talk about some general procedures within the building. So when students are in their classrooms, they're gonna be expected to remain in their seats the majority of the time. Um, the desks will be designed in rows where they're facing forward. Of course, they're all six feet apart. We have staggered the desks and checked all of the classrooms to make sure that they are within the guidelines. Um, each student will also have some space next to their desk to place their backpack or any other materials that they may have with them so that they can easily access those things that they need. There will also be um, those trifold plexiglass shields will be used for student desks during lunchtime and also for eighth graders during our snack time as well. Um, each classroom has disinfectant spray and paper towels. So after each class period, students will be cleaning their desks and their chairs before they exit the classroom. So each period the desks will be cleaned. And same with that plexiglass when the, that is being used during lunch, that will also be cleaned um, each day after it is being used for lunch. Um, hand washing, of course, that's very, very important. It's high priority for us to make sure our students are safe and have clean hands throughout the day. So we have installed hand sanitizers in every classroom in the building. There's also hand sanitizers at the entrance and exits of all the building and in the hallways as well. So when students are coming in and out of the classroom, they will be asked to use hand sanitizer every time they enter into their next class period. Um, before, also before and after lunch, we will be asking students to wash in the, in the restrooms with, their, with soap and water. And also we're using our science classrooms, which has um, large sinks as well for students to wash their hands before and after they eat. So cleaning hands is definitely a huge priority and we will be enforcing that the whole, all day long. Um, moving throughout the building is also another thing we've been talking about. Um, students will continue to be going to their regular scheduled classes throughout the day. Students will be walking on the right-hand side of the hallway. We will be maintaining six feet distance. Teachers will be in the hallway also assisting students, making sure that they are spaced out. They will not be using lockers. So they will be going directly to their next class and they will have all their materials with them and their backpacks carrying. Um, students may use the restroom during passing period. There will be adults also helping to monitor um, the number of students who are using the restroom to make sure that there is social distancing going on as well um, and the six feet in the hallway while they walk to their next class period. Uh, Ms. Rosen, one second. Um, I'm sorry, I did forget two things from my um, slide. One, when students come to school, when they get to their home bases, temperatures will be checked by staff members. Uh, if the temperature is closing in between 99 and 100, we would ask the child to wait for a second uh, and we will retest them in a, a minute or two later. If it is still high, we will send them down to the office. Uh, if the temperature is over 100.4 or 100.4 or over, we will be uh, contacting parents to come get the child. Um, and as well, dismissal, we're gonna ask students to dismiss the same doors that they entered through. So thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Ms. Rosen, you've covered some of my stuff, which is I'm okay with. Um, but um, as Ms. Rosen stated, we're not gonna be using lockers at least to start the year. So students will be asked to um, use their backpacks to carry materials from class to class. So um, working with you guys as the parents and working with teachers, um, we'd like to just be cognizant of what's going in the backpack so they're not feeling like they're being weighted down by having everything they own in their backpacks at all times. We don't want that. Um, bathroom breaks, Ms. Rosen covered pretty well, um, but obviously, you know, we'd like your students to be cognizant and aware of um, any congregating. So we're not saying that children are not able to use the restroom during passing period, um, but just to be aware that if it seems that the bathroom already has people in it, um, or at least a small line has formed, consider just going from A to B and you can still use the bathroom during your actual class time. Um, and that's gonna be just the normal procedures when it comes to the check-in, check-out. Generally, most teachers' policies, they vary a little bit by grade, but for the most part, usually a teacher allows one 
uh, male, one female out at a time to use the restroom. Um, in terms of snack breaks for eighth grade, Ms. Rosen talked about those trifold shields that are gonna go onto desks. Um, those will be in use during um, lunch and snack breaks. Um, and then right now the snack break is likely to be a single period during the day, um, <clears throat> during the eighth grade time. Um, and then for lunch, and I saw a couple of the questions coming in. I know Ms. Delaney, you'll probably touch on those specific questions, but um, to start the year at the very least, children will be eating with their home base and grouped with another home base um, to keep the amount of total spaces to a minimum, but also because it is A through K, L through Z, um, by grouping two home bases together, we're still able to have less than 15 children will be, be in each space for lunch. Um, so it's not two home bases grouped together in full, it's half of two home bases grouped together. Um, <clears throat> so they will be eating in, um, for the most part, in classrooms. Um, and we have some spaces available that are um, more open spaces. Um, for example, the MP room is a space that is available. Um, but obviously with CDC guidelines, um, we're not able to have the entire grade or even half of a grade in the MP room at one time. Um, you do have the option of having your um, child check out for lunch. Um, they can leave for lunch every day. Um, in the past, we've always just had a sign in, sign out kind of Google form that's available in the front office. Um, we're gonna try to make that more of a touchless procedure with a QR code. Um, it is not yet on the website, but we'll make it available on the website. And we're kind of discussing through um, the exact logistics on that. But essentially, it's going to be as simple as either your child on their way out scans it, which gives access to a form that's um, what is the child's name? Where are you going? Um, and then if a, if a parent wants to, they can fill out that form instead of the child. So it's a touchless procedure. Um, and that's signing it out for lunch. That those are uh, just a little bit of a highlight of uh, our uh, procedures that we're putting in place to try to make sure that everybody stays safe and healthy. Um, we're ready, uh, Ms. Delaney, to begin questions. Okay, one of the questions that's come up is about busing. Um, how many kids will be allowed on the bus? Will they be? Uh, Will they have to wear masks? Will that be enforced? And when will parents get the bus route information and the times for pickups? So for my understanding that all bus information was uh, sent out via mail, US mail, uh, two days ago. So please check your mailboxes for all bus information. Uh, there will be uh, students, one student to a chair um, throughout the bus. So at the most, uh, I believe it, the bus holds 48. So uh, 24 students somewhere in, in that nature would be the most on a, on a bus. And yes, as soon as the students walk onto that bus, they need to have their masks on and remain on the entire time. If they choose not to, then they will not be riding the bus. Dr. Morrison, will any, uh, will there be an option for paid riders on the buses then, or will the buses only be for those that qualify for free busing? That's a great question. I would have to ask district office. It really depends on our number of students on each bus. If the, if the majority, we have to make sure that we have uh, open seating to make sure kids stay six feet apart and not seating next to each other. So if there are open spaces, that would be something that we would have to work out. Okay. Um, to go along with that morning routine, um, are students allowed to ride their bikes to school? Yes. Okay. And um, sorry. We're, we're kind of hoping with the with the bikes um, because we actually do have a, quite a large amount of bike racks, which in pre-COVID times they still get pretty jam packed with bikes. But we're hopeful that on nice weather days when students are biking and with half as many students. Um, between our uh, morning lineup supervisors, we're going to be encouraging them to um, ask your child to just kind of be aware of where bikes are and feel free to 
maybe park your bike not necessarily next to the exact door that you would go in, but take advantage of all the ones that are spread out along the building. Okay. Um, so to go to some more uh, educational questions, um, are this, how are students um, and teachers going to coordinate the in-person versus remote at the same time? There are some parents and students that are concerned that they're going to feel left out on the days that they're remote while other people are in class. Yeah, that, that's uh, something that we're all worried about, that the teachers are cognizant about. And we, you know, it'll be an evolution uh, uh, process of you know, in the instruction that we're going to continue to work on as we go, because we until we do it, we're not quite sure. We've been practicing and we're asking teachers the next two days to practice how this would work out to make sure that they are giving as much um, attention to both those who are in class as well as those who are remote. And it's just going to need to be uh, positioning of themselves in the classroom, making sure we have microphones set up so that uh, the, the people the people who are remote will be able to get the same experience or as close to the same experience as those who are uh, in the classroom. Will it be exactly the same? No. I'll be honest with you. There's no way that if you are remote that you'd be able to get the exact same experiences uh, of being in person. But we will do our best to make sure that we are making those connections. We are answering those questions. We are helping those students out who uh, are remote uh, learning at, at, on those days. Um, do you have the percentage of the students that are have chosen hybrid versus those that are going to stay full remote? I believe we're at about 10% mm -hmm. that are fully remote. And are there any plans for teachers to, um, like a special group of teachers to teach the all remote students or will they always be part of the hybrid model? There's, yeah, there's no plans for additional teachers to teach at this moment in this model. It will be the classroom teachers teaching for both. Are any of those classroom teachers teaching remotely so that they're zooming into the classroom because they are remote? We do have uh, a, a few teachers who are remotely teaching, but we also have uh, people who are going to be uh, partner teaching with them in the classroom. Okay. Um, okay. What, if, uh, how do you plan on dealing with the, the distance um, and the mask wearing um, in the bathrooms, in the hallways, um, once kids are in their class, in their desks, and they're six feet apart, do they still need to leave their masks on? Yes. Yep. Absolutely. The, you know, it, it, of one thing that I will tell you, students will be wearing and must be wearing masks throughout the day, except for lunch. Um, and when they're outside for PE and they're six feet apart and teachers are directing them, it's okay to take their masks off. Other than that, they have to have their masks on at all times, period. And, it, you know, and I'm not trying to be um, tough on anyone, uh, but I want to make sure that everybody stays healthy and safe. And if you, your child and you don't feel that that's, that's a right thing, you also always have the option of doing remote learning. Um, but to be in person and to make sure we can keep this going forward, students have to wear masks. And I know it's gonna be very difficult because I, I see your, you know, the kids out on the, the playground running around in the community and they're not wearing masks and they're not keeping social distance. So it's gonna be a struggle for them coming in. We will do our best to remind them. There are tape marks on the walls keeping for six foot distances. Um, the desks are definitely spread apart. So that at least in the classroom, we for sure will have them six feet apart. But I will tell you, there will be times in the hallways where we may not be able to handle and say specifically every child will be six feet apart, but they will make sure they're wearing masks and they will not be touching one another. As soon as you start touching someone else, then we're worried about the passing of germs. Okay. Um, 
Can I, can I add to that? Yesterday, I participated in a um, discussion on students in COVID and um, led by Dr. Daniel Johnson from the University of Chicago. He's an um, infectious disease specialist and some physicians from Chicago Public Health Department in the Illinois Department of Public Health. And we were really looking specifically at some of the older students, our 12 through 17 year olds. And the one thing that came out from each of these physicians who deal with people who, students who are ill and deal with schools is that masks are working for students. Students who keep their masks on, use the appropriate type of mask, keep it over their nose, wear it appropriately and keep their distance. It is helping to control the spread of COVID in the conjugate setting. So if you can help your children between now and Tuesday learn to wear their masks or practice wearing them, um, it's, it's doable. And we know that that's one of the few things that we have control over is wearing your masks and keeping your hands clean and keeping your distance. To, to go along with that, um, will there be plexiglass during between children during lunch since they will have their masks off? Yes, yes. Anytime students are eating the plexiglass trifold will be up. Also with eighth grade doing snack, they will also be up for that as well. Always while they're eating. And that will be the only time they would take their mask off except for PE like Dr. Morrison said. And will, will there be extra masks at school if, if a student forgets theirs or has trouble with theirs? Absolutely, yes. Each classroom teacher has two masks if something happens to a student's mask, as well as we have many in the office. So a student comes in and we see that they don't have a mask and we will send them directly to the school office to get a mask. Okay. Um, there have been a few questions about, about teachers that are teaching remotely that, so they're not in the building. Um, right. do we, are we providing a list of those teachers? There are some parents that, um, think that they may change their, their vote on hybrid versus remote, um, depending on which teachers are not in the building or is, do we know the percentage of teachers that are going to be in the building with classes? All right. So with that, um, I, honestly, I, I do not have the been given the directive that I can share those names out because we are still working through that process. As soon as I, I can, I will share the names out. Um, it, it, that's the best answer I can give you at this point in time. Okay. Um, uh, there's some concern about how children will be treated um, that are on the days that they're remote or if they've chosen complete remote um, instruction, will teachers have um, microphones so that it's easy to hear them through their masks? Um, will How is it going to be monitored if a student that's remote has a question or a comment or a you know, how, how will that ha go back and forth between the in-person and the remote? Sure, well, just like with, if, a, if students are remote and the teachers in the classroom, um, obviously if the remote students asking questions are able to do that, the teachers themselves, again, it's, it is a, a balance for sure, um, but no one is being directed to actively uh, avoid or ignore those on the computer because we want to make sure that they're having their questions heard as well. So between chat box, the hand emoji, physically having your hand up, um, the setups that the teachers are getting ready for this hybrid model are pretty amazing to see them problem solving to have it so that they can see the students on Zoom while at the same time being able to work with the students that are in front of them. Um, in a socially distanced manner. Teachers will have microphones. There, there are big uh, phone microphones that we've been using that work very well so that the students who are remote can also hear the questions going on in class. They can hear the teacher's response. Um, we've seen it work in uh, th with the kids, the classrooms where the kids are here already, um, which has given us a great opportunity to check out to see what works and what doesn't. How about Jim changing for PE? How will that be handled? 
So at this point in time, um, we're looking at children only changing their into gym shoes. Um, if they go into the fitness room, they may be asked to, to change, but it would only be a small group. Um, and that would be making sure that there's definitely social distance in that case. But at the beginning, we are not looking to change for PE at this point in time. Children will be given their, their physical education clothes that they purchased. Um, but as we move forward, then that will, uh, we'll have to work that through with our physical education department. But right now we take a step at a time. Please understand that parents, it, it is going to be slow at first. We are gonna start, it's almost gonna be like the first day of school, those first couple of days where t kids are gonna learn all their expectations, how to handle things in the classroom, where to put stuff, that sort of thing. So there may, you may see some remote, in the remote setting, you may see some asynchronous work for the first couple of days because most of it is going to be just talking about procedures within the classroom, um, just so you're, you're, you're aware. Um, but we're, you know, we're going to continue to grow uh, with, in, with technology and instruction to make sure that we do our, what's best for our kids. Um, you brought up the sixth graders. How will the sixth graders know where to go that first day? Because it's been so long since we had the open house um, for them. And uh, the other question was school supplies. Um, what should the students bring and are they responsible for bringing any cleaning supplies with them? I can take that one. Um, so the sixth graders um, have certain doors to go in. So if they, if the parents pull in the front entrance, they're going to go all the way, pull all the way down to the end. There will be a lot of adults outside for sure on the first day and obviously the first week to show students where to go. Also, once the sixth graders are in the building, the teams are working on um, staggered tours of the building. So all the kids are not touring at the same time, but they will have the opportunity to have a tour of the building again, even though they've, they might've come for the orientation or they might not have, they will have the opportunity to have a tour of the building as well. And then you asked about materials. Um, the teachers will be letting the students know what they need. So they shouldn't bring everything at the first day because they're not gonna have a locker to put it in like they normally would. So the first day I would just recommend bringing assignment notebooks, of course your Chromebook, maybe paper, notebooks, um, something to write with, and then your teachers throughout the day will let you know what you need for each class and what you need to bring. As Ms. Rose is indicating, they're actually right now working on a list. They're looking at the, um, the actual list that they gave out in the summer. They're reducing it to the, only the things that students need because we don't want them carrying everything in their backpack because that's where it's going to be. Um, you know, some of them backpacks get bigger than the kids. Uh, so we're going to create that list and I'm going to be sending it out to you um, uh, hopefully before the weekend. So that, that's our goal. Um, quite a few questions about cleaning and supervision of cleaning. Um, when would we have to shut down? Um, when do we anticipate being full time in person? Um, Those, those kind of, of COVID-19 related questions. Well, uh, Carol, do you want to handle the COVID stuff? You know, give, kind of give a brief overview of how we would handle someone who their child comes who's co has is tested positive or not feeling well and how we would do all the pieces with col close contact. Okay, uh, I think I'll start with the one where it would happen if your child got sick in school. So we will handle your child um, like we have in the past. If they're sick, they will get assessed by uh, the nurse that's in the office. Um, we will take into consideration what the symptoms are that we know about COVID right now. And every child who presents to the health office will sort of will be assessed based on that criteria of us looking to see are these symptoms potentially um, indicative of there being a case of coronavirus, of this child being COVID positive. We also have a little bit of leeway to consider your child's past medical history. So if you have a child who has asthma and we have an inhaler for them in school and they're coughing and they don't have other symptoms, we might be able to 
um, treat them for their asthma if we have their inhaler and see how it goes. So we don't have to first shot, first presentation of a symptom, one symptom for a child who has a history, shoo them out the door and say, oh, they might be COVID positive. We have a little bit of leeway to do an assessment on them. So, but that being said, we do have our health offices are separated now. Um, if you're familiar with them, the room with the beds will become our primary isolation room. And students that come to us and we think there's a possibility that they have coronavirus or some illnesses progressing, we'll get put in that room, doors will be shut. Other students we're going to keep out of that room. And if we happen to have another student who's ill, with or an injury with something else, we have an additional space in the office suite to put the students. So we've expanded our health office um, if it's needed. But if your child is ill and we send them home, we're going to strongly ask that you contact your physician. And if they have symptoms of COVID that you get a COVID test. And the latest recommendations coming from public health are within 48 hours of the onset of symptoms, they would like students to be tested. So we could find out if they're COVID positive right away. And so, then, sorry. I'm sorry, please. And then how would quarantine be handled? Um, okay, so I wanna be real clear. Quarantine is, I'm, I'm gonna finish with, if we have a child who's sick, possibly has COVID, we send them home. That child we will ask, that they will go into isolation, which means they need to stay out of school for 10 days. That's following CDC, IDPH, Cook County Department of Health guidelines for handling someone who is symptomatic of COVID. Getting a test is the best way to determine whether your child is COVID positive or not. And if they're not, after their symptoms have been resolved, getting them back into school. But if they are COVID positive, they must stay home for the 10 days. That's isolation. Those are for individuals who are symptomatic or if for some reason they have a COVID test and they don't have symptoms, that COVID test is positive. So positive COVID test, symptoms of coronavirus, child must stay home for 10 days. That's isolation. Quarantine, on the other hand, is 14 days. And children and adults need to be quarantined if they have a known exposure to coronavirus or a probable case. And by probable case, I mean that they have been exposed to someone who's very symptomatic and we're sort of waiting on that contacts positive COVID test. That 14 days um, will ensure per their guidelines that we will not spread. I'm watching the questions go fast, but that will not control the spread of any potential illness in the school. So an ill child with symptoms of coronavirus or a positive test, 10 days, if you're a close contact, that's 14 days staying home because we know it takes time for coronavirus if you become positive to manifest. How will we handle those contacts in school if we have a positive case? We will do contact tracing. And I know you hear that a lot in um, the news. So if we have a student who goes home ill with symptoms of coronavirus and we get a call and we're told that that child or that was COVID positive, we will look at who they were with for how long, generate that list of names in contact Cook County Department of Public Health because they will give us our guidance then for determining who needs to quarantine because they were exposed to this individual. And the exposure guidelines that Cook County has been using is if you were exposed to this person who is positive for 15 minutes within six feet. So you can see where that we want the children to stay six feet apart from other individuals in the school comes into play. If they're closer than six feet for more than 15 minutes, those are the people that need to quarantine. 
So when we talk a lot about keeping our distance, keeping our space, wearing our masks, that's to help prevent us having to quarantine clusters of students in school. So Carol, just to confirm, just because a student is in a class with a student who has symptoms does not mean they would have to quarantine if they were not sitting near each other in that classroom. Correct. That's the purpose of having these students be six feet apart. Okay. So six feet apart with their masks on. Um, but say we do have a case and um, if your child we determined is a, was a close contact, you will be notified by the district. And we won't do it all broadcast, but students who have been exposed and we're concerned about that and Cook County is saying, we've got to notify these families, you will get either a phone call and a letter from district administration that there was the potential for an exposure and we're going to ask you to quarantine. And, and how would we do that as far as using bathrooms and hallways? Um, how are we going to guarantee that six feet apart in those less structured settings? So I'll, I'll, go I'll ahead. Go that one. So, so actually we can't guarantee that. That's, if, if anything, the areas that we would have to worry about are our hallways and our uh, going in and out up the stairwells and uh, coming to and from school. Uh, so that's where we have to ask you as parents to work with us to make sure your children know that um, in the hallways, they, you know, going to and from classes to do their best to stay six feet apart. Now, our, our passing periods are three minutes in length. So if someone's closer than that uh, for that three minutes length, that's not a, you know, that's okay. It's if they're three minutes late for five periods in, you know, five periods throughout the day, then we're talking about close contact. That's 15 minutes collective time. And then, you know, that's going to be uh, where we're going to start saying, well, that's close contact. And so then that child would need to go home. Now, do we broadcast who, um, like, you know, Carol was saying that we don't, we send messages home to parents. If we have a confirmed case within the school, we will let the, uh, all parents know, but we will not tell anyone who it is. We will not confirm any identities and uh, who's on um, close contact uh, in that realm. Because, you know, people's privacy is, is important as well. I'm going, to, I'm going to jump in. I see this question about quarantine for 14 days for close contact, but only 10 days for a positive test. That's because we know that it takes time for coronavirus to develop in an individual who's been exposed to a high enough viral load to contract the disease. If you are positive for coronavirus, you've had that lag or lead time. And we know that throughout 10 days from a positive test or the onset of symptoms, by the time that 10 days is passed, you're, vi you're not shedding virus and you're no longer considered contagious. The 14 days is because you've been exposed, but it's going to take time for symptoms to develop. And we know that on average, if you've been exposed and you're going to develop a case of COVID-19, it takes about five to seven days, three to seven days for you to develop symptoms. So we look for there's an exposure, it takes some time for you to sort of brew this virus and then become symptomatic. And it can be as long as nine or 10 days or 12 days. So two days of exposure, if you're exposed, it's about two days for you possibly to start working this virus and maybe up to 12 more days to become symptomatic. So they've made it very long to try and ensure that we don't have individuals who are going to develop coronavirus be in the community, in particular if they're symptomatic. I hope that helps. I know that was a long explanation, but it has to do with the time you're exposed and develop symptoms versus we know you have coronavirus or you develop the symptoms. And then there was a question right above that about a negative test has a um, 
fever and then test again. We've heard the tests are not that reliable. There's two different kinds of tests. There's an antigen test and a PCR test. The PCR test is that big swab that you have to have. And um, the best advice that I can give you is if we've asked your child, you're concerned about your child because they have a fever and you want a reliable test to get the PCR test, it tends to be more reliable, but you're right. No test is symptomatic. So if a child has a fever and they have a negative COVID test, um, we're still not letting that child back into school until their symptoms have resolved, just like we did prior. When a child has a fever, they have to be fever free before they can come back into school. They their symptoms have to resolve. And the nurses in the school will be in contact with families, keeping track of the children that are out presenting with COVID symptoms. The best thing you can do to help us is to be in communication with the nurses in your schools and sharing information about your child's illness. That will help us keep an eye on what's happening in our schools and hopefully manage contact tracing. Um, it's 10 after six, so I have two questions I'd like to ask. And then um, I just want to make sure that the community knows that we're going to get a copy of the chat and that more information will be coming out from administration based on what's come through the chat. And that if you have anything that's specific to your child or your situation, please feel free to, to email Dr. Morrison directly and have a conversation about that um, more in, on a one-to-one -one basis. But if, if I could just bring up two other questions to the, to the panelists and then we'll go from there. Um, one is, will there ever be a situation in which there's a class of in-person students where the teacher in the room is remote? Okay, yeah, there's students, yeah. We will have, there are some teachers as we spoke before who will be working remotely, a very few but there are a few, there are a couple and we will have guest teachers working with them. So while the teacher's actually teaching the class remotely, we have a teacher in the classroom working with the students, helping them uh, as, you know, almost as a, a teaching assistant would help. And help. then will the school day end at 245 for everyone or are, is there an, uh, an opportunity for 11th hour for students that might require additional assistance? So right at this point in time, we are not having activity bus to go home because we're trying to make sure we are able to handle this first stage of having kids here. That doesn't mean that if teachers are, are, or students are requesting 11th hour, as long as parents can guarantee that they get picked up or they have a transportation home, we will still be able to keep children for 11th hour. Okay. We we didn't hit every single one, but we I think we hit most of the of the general topics. There are some specifics, um, you know that that we can answer afterwards. But um, like the band band will probably let parents so, know. Yeah. So so if we're talking about band, I saw that pop up a couple times, and I know we got a couple minutes left here. Um, the band will be remote until the uh, state gives us guidelines that uh, students can be allowed to uh, play without masks. Um, because unless they're outside six feet apart, um, they cannot be, uh, the wind instruments cannot be performing. We could have percussions in. So I know we're looking at doing some jazz band and having just the percussions and the guitars in because they don't have to blow into an instrument and we can keep them 10 feet apart. But the rest of them will have to still be remote, handled remotely until we have direction. Uh, and I would say it's probably gonna be until we're close to being uh, fully uh, having all the kids here. Um, that's gonna, that would, you know, I don't think that's gonna change any. Okay. Um, there are a couple questions about ventilation, if we've made any improvements to our ventilation system. And then there were a couple questions about students that have individualized education plans and how um, their services would look with the half remote and the half hybrid. Um, I think those we might be able to deal with um, in 
in our uh, conversations in our our new you know our newsletters. Um, there was one other one that I wanted to bring up, and I apologize. It's okay. Not having. Um, oh, can students and parents go back and forth between hybrid and remote? Like, my student isn't feeling well today, so we're going to be remote today, but they're typically going to be hybrid. How how does that work? No, if if uh, if you've decided to have your child in hybrid they will remain in hybrid. If your child is sick, they should be home and, and not even on the computer. They should be getting, you know, taken care of, get well, just like we would normally do on a regular day basis. And um, and then, you know, once they're better, they can, you know, come back to school just like we would do any other child who's attending school. Hybrid, if, you cho if you've chosen to do remote, uh, as the district office has, has indicated, you cannot change back to a uh, hybrid model until the next stage. Um, so some reason, November, a, a date in November, somewhere at that point in time. I'll, I'll clarify that and put it in the newsletter of when parents can choose to come back. If a child is quarantined, will they still be able to remote in? Was it the question that just kind of ties to that? Um, yes. If the child is sick, they should not be, you know, they're, they're sick. They, they're at home, have them get better. I mean, that's that's their goal. If they're quarantined because they were in close contact, yes, they can remain remote. So that's the difference between the two. There's a couple of questions that are coming up about if a child is homesick um, and then they get a, if they're home, if, if they had a contact with someone who is positive, but take a test after five to seven days and the test is negative, can the student come back sooner? No. If you have been told that you must quarantine because you were a close contact, that quarantine is in effect for 14 days. You don't get to come in sooner because you had a negative COVID test because we know that it could take up to nine or 10 days or 11 days for you to develop coronavirus. So when you're in quarantine, you must quarantine for the full length of time. If a child goes home sick with symptoms, symptomatic of COVID, and the parents refuse to get a test, that child stays out of school for 10 days. If the child has a positive test, that child stays out of school for 10 days. Symptomatic, of COVID or positive test, there's a 10 day isolation before we can let you back into school. If you're quarantined, we wanna be sure that you're not going to develop coronavirus, hence the quarantining, keeping you away from others. That's 14 days. I'm sorry, but there's no get out of quarantine free card. The 14 days is it. The only um, a question to add to that that was brought up though is, um, would a child be able to return back if they were quarantined uh, because of a possible exposure to a possible case, not an actual positive case? Yes. If that potential contact, if your contact actually then tests negative, that's your, I guess that would be your get out of jail. That's the get out of jail for you. So that's everyone, everyone who has quarantined as a result of a probable case, if that probable case ends up not having it, then then everyone that was close contact with that probable case can return right away. And we're going to really work hard to keep close track of everything. So again, if you have a family member who is sick, it's not your child, but it's somebody living in your house, let us know that your child's going to have to quarantine, um, but that's the way we're gonna make hybrid work. If we're all open with each other, we're all going to have each other's backs with keeping everybody healthy and hybrid will work when we work together as a, as a, as a community. When, so, will this, when will this be uh, live for people who either missed the beginning or had technical difficulties or were not able to come tonight? Sure. I've been recording this uh, entire program uh, as soon as I can work with this district office to get one this figured out how to get it onto the website um we will get it there within the next day or two so um thank you everybody you know i, I know it sounds kind of harsh but you know what everybody's worked so hard to get kids back in school we all want kids back in school 
you know, we're dying to have them here, but to keep them here, we have to follow these rules to a T and we need your support and backing on this. And I know it's not going to be great. I know it's, there's going to be bumps and bruises along the way. We're learning, uh, you know, I, I've been in the business for this, my, you know, 33rd year, and I've never seen anything like this. I've never experienced anything like this, nor has anyone else. And so we're all trying, we're all new at this game. So please be patient with us. Please communicate with us. And we will do our best to make sure that your children have the best experience possible. So um, our you. panel is over. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will take, uh, we'll take all the questions that were here. And if there were specific ones that we missed, uh, I will make sure that we put it in the answers in the Cardinal Corner. Or I talk to you personally one or the other so i hope uh, you have a great evening everybody stay healthy um and take care goodbye bye-bye yes.